Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church of Gainesville, Florida. We are glad that you made time to be with us today. We believe that when we gather as a community of God, even virtually, that God is with us and God moves powerfully among us. Wherever, wherever you are today, at home in your living room, uh, somewhere else, I pray that God is connecting you with this body of believers and with the body of believers around the world who are worshiping and serving God. If you are new with us, we have a very interactive worship style. Uh, you can get a copy of our bulletin on our webpage. And uh, whether you are watching on your television or whether you're watching uh, over the YouTube feed, uh, a copy of the correct bulletin is available for you. So you can uh, get that off the first page of our webpage and either uh, just look at it or download and print it out. Um, we have a few announcements uh, in our bulletin today. I'm going to highlight uh, just a few of them, but make sure that you read through all of them so you know what's going on in the life of your church. We extend our sympathy and offer prayers of our congregation to Curtis Murphy, Jenny Murphy, and Lindsay Johnson upon the passing of their wife and mother, Sylvia Murphy, who joined the church triumphant on August 10th, 2020. Later in the service today, we will be taking communion together. Please gather the elements that you need uh, to participate with us, some kind of a cracker or bread, some kind of juice or drink so that you can participate along with us. Uh, a lot of activity and time in this congregation has been spent over the questions of reopening, how we reopen, when we reopen, what does it look like. We have a reopening team that we have assembled and they have been uh, really working hard on these questions. Um, if you are a regular part of our church, you should have received an email or a letter from us um, highlighting uh, what a reopening uh, might look like in the church, um, how things would look similar, how things would look different. Included in that uh, letter and email is a survey that either you can take um, by paper and mail it back into us or can take online and it will uh, get to us. Uh, please take some time to do that. We would like to hear from you um, about what you think about our consideration of a reopening. If you could get those back to us no later than August 21st, um, our session uh, can uh, consider them as they ask this next round of reopening questions. And our session will be meeting on Wednesday, August 26th, and a lot of that meeting will be about that. We would like to lift up those that are on the front lines of the COVID-19 battle. If you are an essential worker, we would like to pray for you by name. Uh, please give us your name. Uh, let us know what you do. And uh, we're going to regularly start including some names of essential workers in our church that are um, out there on the front lines of this battle. And uh, they also might come up in some of our pastoral prayers. So uh, either give us your name or if there's somebody... Uh, in your family that you want to give us, make sure that it's okay with them first. Uh, check that out with them, but we would like to pray for you by name. Let us continue to worship the Lord.
I invite you to join me in our call to worship in the opening hymn, number 299, Your Servants of God, Your Master Proclaim. If you're following along in the worship guide, the hymns can be found starting on page 3. God has forgiven us and drawn us close. Reconciled us through Jesus Christ. It is the same Jesus who has lavished upon us the fullness of the blessed Holy Spirit. With glad and grateful hearts, we praise the Lord. Let us confess our sins without fear to the one who yearns to embrace us, forgive us, protect us, and bless us. Join us in our corporate prayer, followed by a time of silent personal reflection. Have mercy on us, Lord Jesus. We are tormented. Our lives have been disrupted by the devil and by our own devilish desires and evil exploits. We are dismayed at your presence, anguished by the awful fallout of our own failures. We cannot take back what we have said, or undo what we have done, or atone for the agony we have caused. We are haunted by the past, plagued by the present, and fearful of the future. We shrink away from your gaze as strangers outside your circle of blessing. Yet the faith you have planted in us reaches out for your favor, returns to your presence, and hungers for your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, O oh Lord, transform us as we continue our confession in silence.
Through the abundant provision of our Lord Jesus Christ, our God greets us with kindness, forgiving our sins, preserving our lives, and restoring our souls. Receive now that for which faith has hungered. You are forgiven and healed in the name of Jesus Christ. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Let us now prepare our hearts for the reading of God's Word with the prayer of illumination. Let us pray. Merciful, wonderful, loving Savior, your suffering has saved our lives, secured our future, and restored us to relationship with your Father, Almighty God. Remove the shame and fear that cause us to cower in your presence. And by the power of your Spirit, open our eyes and open our hearts to your word, your word of love, mercy, healing, and blessing. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Today's Old Testament reading is 1 Kings 19. 9 through 18. Please hear the word of the Lord. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets by the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go. Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat of abel Mehelah, as the prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall kill. And whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We now invite you, regardless of age, to a point in the service where we hold space for a lesson dedicated to our children. Please join us for a time for young disciples. I wonder how many of you have ever listened to someone whisper a message. I imagine if someone whispered to me right now, I might whisper my response or pay really close attention and maybe even need to be extra quiet so I could hear everything that they were saying. Were you listening to our first scripture reading today? Someone whispered, and I wonder if you noticed who it was. Let's do a quick review. We heard about a man named Elijah. Elijah was a prophet, a man chosen by God to tell the people God's message. He did some things sort of like a pastor would do today. Elijah had seen God do some amazing things, but now he was tired, discouraged, and afraid. The queen didn't serve God and didn't like Elijah. In fact, she threatened to kill him. So he ran away from her and from the people he was trying to help, and he hid. Elijah was hiding in a cave and trying to figure out what God wanted him to do next. God sent a strong windstorm. Then he sent an earthquake. And there was also a great fire. Elijah thought he would hear God's voice in all of that power. But he didn't. 
You'll never guess how God finally spoke to him. He spoke to him in the silence, in a gentle whisper. Wait, a whisper. There it is. God is the one who was whispering. God told Elijah what he should do, what he should say to the people, and he promised that he would protect him from the queen. Elijah was not alone. So Elijah did what God said and went back to the people and gave them God's message. I find it easy to relate to Elijah. He was discouraged and wanted to give up when things were hard. We also get tired of doing what is right or afraid of people who don't like us. We forget God's goodness and his power. And just like Elijah, we don't have the strength to obey God on our own. Only God can give us the strength to keep going when life is hard. Now, God may use a really big storm to get our attention for a little while, but generally the times God speaks to us most is when we read the Bible, when we pray, or when a teacher or pastor teaches us something and we know in our hearts that God is speaking to us and telling us what he wants us to do. I wonder what can we do when we are afraid or discouraged or we don't even know what to do. We can ask God to show us that we are not alone. He is with us and he will help us. Our part is to listen for his whisper and find the answer. Let us pray. Dear God, Dear God thank you for being with us. Thank you for being with us. Help us hear you when you whisper. Help us hear you when you whisper. Remind us to find our strength in you. Remind us to find our strength in you. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our New Testament reading and preaching text can be found in Matthew chapter 14, verses 23 through 36. Matthew 14, 23 through 36. And after he had dismissed the crowds, Jesus went up the mountain to him by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against the disciples. And early in the morning, Jesus came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, it's a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. 
But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me! Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gesineret. After the people of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word throughout the region and brought all who were sick to him. And begging him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Apostle Paul lamented, Why do I do what I do not want to do? Even he suffered from his actions and his faith not lining up. Even though he had already been beaten and would eventually give his life for this cause. How many of us are regularly tormented by actions we carried out maybe when we were young, maybe maybe when we were momentarily naive, or maybe even actions that we committed this morning? Why did I do that? Or, I, I didn't understand the consequences. In this story today, the author Matthew tells us about Jesus and his disciples Jesus sent his disciples away on a boat as he himself went away from everyone to pray. Now this is a regular picture we get of Jesus. Jesus apparently doesn't have a good feel for marketing because he has these big moments sometimes where he does these big miracles or makes these big claims and the crowds are rallied behind him. And what he needs to do is use that momentum and run with it, you know, to accomplish his goals in setting up his kingdom and doing things. But it doesn't seem like Jesus is too motivated by that. Often at the most inopportune times, he pulls away from everyone and goes to pray. He goes to reconnect with his God. That seems to be his highest value. Whenever we read Scripture, we have to work to understand the life, the culture, their surroundings, the way the people of their time did. Not so that we will agree with how they understood it, but once we understand it, it often opens up the power of the lesson, the power of the point Jesus is going to make. One of these aspects that we regularly have to engage in Scripture is how they saw water. And by water, I mean large lakes, seas, large bodies of water. If you go into my office, you'll see a couple of prominent pictures. One of them is the picture of a beach and the ocean, the waves coming into the beach. The other picture is a picture of the intercoastal uh, boats and the water. I love water. Most of the people in our state love water. The people of the Bible are not Floridians. They do not enjoy water. To them, water is where they go reluctantly, kind of only when they're forced. They go there for food, they go there for trade, and sometimes they even go there for war. It's the place where you say goodbye to a family member and don't know if you'll ever see them again. And not only not even see them, is a possibility. If you don't see them, there's a good likelihood that you'll never find out what happened to them. Did they just go away and couldn't get back? Did they sink in the middle of some body of water where no one knows that it happened and no one knows where they are? To the people of the Bible, the water, the sea, is always a place of fear and intrepidation whether it's talking literally or figuratively. And also, think about it being a source of storms. Here in the state of Florida, about every evening in the summer, we get a storm. Uh, Prior to being able to look on an app or uh, to watch the weather or read about it in the paper, you would always be asking these questions. Is this the big one? Is this a hurricane? Is something awful coming in? 
though they had to interact with them. Large bodies of water always brought uh, nervousness and fear. So Jesus lets his disciples go on this boat, boat in this body of water. And don't miss the risk that the disciples would have felt in that. And as the boat gets battered by the sea, Jesus comes walking towards them on the water. Now, it said it in kind of a funny way in our scripture today. Uh, you could have read over that and thought, oh, it's talking about Jesus is right on the coastline. You know, maybe he's getting his feet wet just a little bit. Maybe he's a little bit farther out in the breakers uh, walking like that. But no, that's not what it was talking about at all. Jesus is walking towards them literally on top of the water. And the disciples once again show us that they are unable to understand their master, understand who he is and what he is about and the power that he holds. Because his coming toward them doesn't bring comfort, it brings fear. It's a ghost. What is this? We've got to escape it. Who are you? Stop! Jesus is coming to rescue them. And even Peter sets up a little test. Okay, if you're really who you say you are, tell me to come to you. Jesus says come. Now this surprised me. I would have expected Jesus to chastise Peter a little bit. Peter, don't you know who I am? Or maybe even a get behind me, Satan. But no, Jesus says come. So Peter came. And he too started walking upon the water until he started looking around and noticing the winds and getting scared, which is exactly what Jesus told him not to do. And Peter started sinking. And he cries out, save me, Lord. And Jesus reaches out to him and grabs him and says to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? It hit me this week how far away uh, these Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were written from uh, the time that it happened, these events happened with Jesus. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were probably written maybe in the 60s A.D. sometimes, so they're about 30 years out. John could have been as late as the 90s or, or even a little bit later, quite a while before these events took place. And my guess is that they're thinking back on these events and they're seeing how their lives have gone and they're seeing themselves in this position over and over. The church has gone through a lot by this time and it's about to go through a lot more as following Jesus is becoming more and more incongruent with being under the authority of Rome. They've lived their faith through everyday challenges and more extreme ones. And regularly they've experienced themselves losing focus on who Jesus is and what he's calling them to do. And instead of focusing on Jesus, they've been focusing on lesser realities. The storms that they surround them. And when they do that, the problems seem to become the greater reality. I want to tell you what this sermon is not. This sermon is not a formula about how to escape all of your problems. Keep your eyes on Jesus and all your problems will disappear. That's a lie. That's not a sermon. Instead, I'm calling out to all of us, giving us a warning. This picture here, this is what we do. This is who we are. We are the ones that tell ourselves we're following Jesus, but regularly take our eyes off of him and focus on the other things around us. So often the storms that go on around us, the winds that blow us, the waters that bang against us, those are the Lord that we listen to. Those are what we think as reality and in charge. We regularly take our eyes off Jesus and let these scary things become the boss. 
We're going to do this time and time again in our lives. And just when some of us think we've gotten to the place where we won't do that, life is going to send us a curveball that was harder than other things that we've experienced. We live in a world of chaos and calamity. Notice that Jesus doesn't initially make the storm go away. Some of the storms we face will be on us for a long, long time. But Jesus is the Savior that comes to us and says, why did you doubt? Essentially, he's saying, you know I'd come. That's my nature. That's who I am. But just like these disciples, that's often who we forget Jesus is. God never expects us to live a perfect life to overcome all of the battles. But more and more, because of our experiences with God in good times and bad, He wants us to become more and more convinced of who He is. He's the one who will save us from anything we face even if things we face are as tragic as death. As a church, we need to look at each other and remind each other that the wind is there, it is real, but it doesn't have the final word. Jesus does. Will we always have people in our congregation getting bad news? Yeah. We will have doctors come back with um, news that we don't want to hear. We will have relationships that come to an end tragically. We'll have financial hardships. We'll also hear that that life-altering opportunity that we were going to have isn't going to happen. In all these moments, we have to be here together for each other as a church to remind us, Jesus is here. Jesus is still active. This unpredictable stuff isn't so scary to him. As a congregation, Jesus is calling us into the boat together. And you know, that can be scary because often uh, we don't like everybody that Jesus calls together in the boat. That can be one of the challenges. But the question for us is, will we look at the winds in their face and still believe that Jesus hasn't abandoned us. We are all going to have moments where we're scared by the winds that hound us. How will we remind our brothers and sisters of the reality of Jesus when they have moments where the winds have broken through? Will we listen when they remind us? The reality of a church is a lot like the reality of people that Jesus put in the boat. Not everybody gets along, Some are doing better at one moment. Some are doing worse at another. None of us will always do what we're supposed to do. But God's goal for us is to grow in knowledge and experience of who He is and what He is about. And as we live life together as a church, we grow in walking this journey with each other. Now, I want to say something particularly about the time we're in with COVID. One of the real tragedies that has stood out to me during this pandemic is some of the people who have followed Jesus into deep relationships, have set up personal networks uh, that they encourage, that they're supported by, some of those people have had the roughest time uh, because everything that they have done right in how they've approached life has been attacked by this pandemic. And that is tragic. But I want to remind us that this storm doesn't get the last word. We need to take COVID very serious. It is a dangerous disease. It kills people. We can't just say, it'll all be all right. But we remind ourselves that it doesn't have the last word. Jesus is asking us in the middle of this pandemic, why did you doubt? We need to be creative and use opportunities to put ourselves in the boat with those around us, to go forward with the mission that Jesus has. One way our church has seen that a bunch, we have uh, so many people 
who you never would have expected to be on Zoom before that are on Zoom. We've got 80 and 90 year olds that know how to do that on their computer and can make meetings and can make uh, family times and different things. It's not as good as getting together. Um, it's not as good as bringing food over and gathering and doing things like that. But it is still meaningful and it is still an opportunity. We will face this storm and we will face it better as we face it together with Jesus and with each other. Jesus hasn't changed who he is. His care for you hasn't been challenged. Believe in Jesus. Take this virus seriously, but don't have a greater fear of it than you have a hope in your God. Why do we doubt? Let us pray. Lord Jesus, Son of God, you are the one who pursues us. So often we forget that. Our eyes are fixed on other things on fears, on agendas, on all kinds of things. Help them more and more to be convinced of your reality, of your identity as the Son of God and as a good God who cares for all of us. We are so sorry that so often our faith is flimsy. We are thankful for the example you set before us of how we should live. Let us have hope and trust the way you had hope and trust when you were on this earth. Despite facing terribly challenging things, despite going the place that you didn't want to go more than any other, the cross, you were obedient and you went for our account. Lord, we have people in our congregation that are facing terrible things. We pray for the Murphy family as they mourn Sylvia's passing. We pray for those in our congregation that are facing medical challenges. We lift up those who, maybe even worse during this time of COVID, are dealing with hopelessness and depression. We also know how many people have lost their jobs and are facing those challenges too. Lord, Please show up in these situations. Please help us to not doubt. But also help us to know how we can be involved in bringing change. Lord, we lift up those that are on the front lines of this COVID battle. Keep them safe, um, but also keep them where they can continue to help. Bring this time to an end, Lord. Your blessings know no boundaries. Strengthen us to trust in your mercy and the tenacity that you regularly display in reaching to us, reaching out to us with your reconciliation. Amen. I invite you to join us now as we affirm our faith together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
This is the time that we take communion as a body. So uh, make sure that you have gathered what you need at home uh, to participate in this and to uh, go forward at this time. Some kind of bread, cracker, some kind of juice, water, liquid, something like that. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that He taught His disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know, most weeks I give you some image of what communion looks like, of what it looks like to come here trusting God for our care, trusting in God. Um, There are several different images that we could have during this. But the one that I want us to process today came to me from a little girl. Her mother emailed me and said, my daughter's favorite part of the service when we watch every week is communion. And she loves it so much that she practices it throughout the week and uh, holds up her crackers and holds up her sippy cup and pronounces different things. And she goes, And what I wanted you to know the most is what she calls it. She calls it a communion party. And I thought today that would be a great way for us to think about this. God is inviting us to a party. And God is saying, why did you doubt? Come to my party. On the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, filled with my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, Do this in remembrance of me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes again. This is Christ's body broken for you. This is Christ's blood shed for your sin. Let us pray. Holy and merciful God, we are thankful for the gift of your Son, Jesus. Give us the grace to fulfill the commitments we have made during this supper. By the power of your Spirit, reveal to us the mind of Christ so that we may understand the gift you've bestowed upon us and proclaim the message of your gospel to the world. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.
We are the ones who focus on the storm. We are the ones who forget the nature of our God. And he looks at us and he says, why were you worried? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine round about you and bring you hope and bring you peace. Amen.
Join us at First Presbyterian Church every Sunday on our website or watch us on My 11 Sunday mornings at 9.